Welcome back to the worm, y'all. It's time to do some milling. I'm gonna get started on my outdoor shower here that uh, hopefully will work year round. It can even use when it's 15 below zero. And luckily I've already got a big pile of cedar logs here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this backwards. Usually I think, okay, well, let's see, I need to make a floor, how do I make a floor? And then I mill up some logs, put the floor together, and then I think, okay, next thing, uh, some framing. So I go find some different logs or cut down some trees and mill those up, frame the thing together and kind of go step by step. But because I've got this huge pile of logs, these are all from the uh, shooting range that I'm building, I'm gonna actually make myself a pile of lumber beforehand. So as I, think things out, figure things out, I can just pick them up off the lumber pile and slap them up. You know, just mix stuff up every now and then. And I've had somewhere between two and three million questions over the last couple years about this uh, milling setup that I have. When I bought this property a couple years ago and I decided I was going to move out here in a tent, I knew that I wanted to build, spend most of my time just building ridiculous things to keep, to keep me entertained. And there was no way I was going to buy store-bought lumber in order to build all this ridiculous stuff. So, so at the time I'd heard of a chainsaw mill, I didn't even know what it was really. Uh, looked a little bit online in one of the first videos I saw. Don't know the name of it right now, but I'll put a link to the video in the description. I saw one setup that looked, I mean, it looked really straightforward. Nothing fancy, heavy duty, looked like it would last a long time. So I just built one of them. And all you guys have seen it, the two metal plates that go on the end of the logs, you screw it in and then there are a couple bars. I thought I'd put together this video just because of all the questions I get about it. I'll give you all the measurements if anybody wants to duplicate this. Um, know that I don't have experience with any other chainsaw mill setups, but I've used this for a couple of years, all day, every day, and I've had no issues at all with it. The whole setup, I'm guessing is somewhere around a couple hundred bucks. Uh, you guys, I'll show you the uh, chainsaw mill itself. That's from Grandberg. It's their, uh, I believe the part number is G777. It's the smallest uh, mill they make. So I'll show you that. The mill itself cost me, I think I got it on a really great sale. I think it was just over a hundred bucks. The metal, I mean, it's two pieces of scrap metal that it cut out with an angle grinder and then the two bars. And I can't imagine I spent with the mill and all the metal more than a couple hundred bucks. It was probably significantly less than that. So I'll grab my stuff out and uh, set this up to mill a couple logs and uh, I'll show you how it all goes together. Also show you, if I was gonna do this over again, make this whole setup over again, I would do it almost identical to the way it is, but there are a couple things that I would change and that's mostly just because of the size of the logs that I mill. If you're doing bigger stuff than I am, larger diameter, longer logs, harder wood, then you might want to address some of this stuff. I can give you some tips on how I might go about doing that. Also this saw, I've gotten a lot of questions about chainsaws too. I don't, uh, have chainsaw milling experience with a lot of different saws. This is a 261, a still 261. It's a 50 cc and it's about four horsepower, I think, which is a lot of horsepower for a 50 cc saw. I ended up getting this instead of, I had actually bought a Husqvarna. It's around the same price point. I think the Husky was like five or 550. This was maybe 600 bucks. And one of the reasons I ended up getting this one is this, this is about the, largest saw you can get with this narrow of a chain. So the narrower the cut, the less wood you're taking out, the easier it is to make the cut. And this, this saw has worked out really, really well for, I mill mostly probably 80% of what I do is cedar. Cedar's a pretty soft wood, a little bit stringy, but if you debark the cedars, it goes through great. And with this setup, with this saw, this is a 20 inch bar. You can mill up to maybe a 17 inch log. That would be completely maxing it out. There's not really a good way to uh, do anything bigger. You could, in theory, you could cut through a log like this. You could cut through this far and you could turn around and do it the other way. I don't think that uh, would really work too well unless you have a planer because you, you'll, your cut just won't end up perfectly lined up on both sides. So, which is fine out here. I don't really have a lot of trees that are bigger than that anyway. But you can see clamping the mill onto the bar, you lose around three inches or so. You could actually take the dogs off of the saw, and I guess that would give you another inch. I don't do that because I use this saw all the time for felling trees too. I got a smaller saw that I usually use for bucking and felling, but if the tree is big enough or I'm going to do a lot of cutting, I just use this saw, so need to have the dogs on there. 
I believe they say in the manual for this mill that you can use it up to a 18 or 20 inch bar and you could see if this was sitting on top of the log the tip of the bar is sticking out a little bit you could i mean you could use this with a three foot bar on it your bar would stick out here but eventually as you're cutting your bar just wouldn't stay quite even the majority of the other mills they make there's another bar here and then it also clamps onto the tip of the bar so if the bar is not that long you're not going to get too much movement in the tip as you're cutting through the log if this saw did uh, die or i had to do this over again i'm pretty sure i'd just get the same thing i've been really really happy with that i'm quite amazed at how much cutting you can do with a brand new saw like that and not have i haven't done anything to it i mean i sharpen the chain fill it up with gas and oil that's pretty much it and it just keeps going and going and going but i can't even imagine how many piles of logs like this i've milled with that saw probably 20 times this much i don't know it's kind of hard to estimate maybe more than that but if you're milling harder stuff which pretty much everything's harder than this uh, I don't know that that saw would work for you. You'd have to take somebody else's recommendation on based on the size of the logs and the species you're milling. My dad and I tried tried milling a log of teak that was maybe maybe that size or so, and it was unmillable with that chainsaw. I mean, teak is incredibly hard, and it was really well seasoned, but it it was impossible. I mean, if you're doing harder wood or bigger logs, just you know, do your research. Don't. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this chainsaw for everybody trying to mill. It's probably the smallest saw anybody would ever use to mill a significant amount of lumber. This will be an interesting one because it's got uh, a lot of taper to it. It's got a bad spot in the middle and uh, it's not straight. So that's kind of the worst case scenario. I like to uh, I like to put these with the the bend up. You can also do it down. It kind of depends on how much bend there is in a log. But I found overall it's easier to uh, any curve to put it facing directly up. So these plates I just made from uh, some scrap steel give you the dimensions. That's 12 inches long, five inches tall, and then the cutouts here are two inches by an inch and a half it's two inches wide because that's the uh, bar that'll fit in here is two by two and an inch and a half deep because the bar has to stick up a little bit out of the top and that's what the mill rides on when i first made this i drilled holes let's see every two inches along the bottom and then at some point i went back and put a couple more holes in put them even lower so those are an inch apart i think if i did this again i would put a hole every inch uh, because i don't mill any huge logs i really don't ever use these out, outside holes the other thing i would do is bring these holes down as close to the bottom as i can without having uh you know to worry about them busting out of there these holes are just big enough to fit i use just regular wood screws so they just need to be big enough to fit whatever kind of screws you're going to use i use the longest ones i have here are three and a half inches it looks like about a three eighths inch hole but drill whatever size hole you want put them as close to the bottom as possible so the reason I want those holes so close to the bottom and closer together than I made them is if you ever mill any really small logs like this, this is at the limit of what's even worth milling. This would probably only give me like two one inch boards because the other side is even narrower than this. But you want to put this up as high as you possibly can. If you screwed it in here, it's totally fine, but you're going to lose the whole top of the log to just junk. So you put it up as high as you can just so that it'll still, you know, stay in the log. It won't wiggle around with only say three screws in it. If you put the holes too far apart or too high up, then you just end up losing more of the log on the first cut. So it wouldn't even hurt if you got the time and you got a drill press or something, it wouldn't hurt to put these down close to the bottom and put them every half an inch all the way across the bottom. And some of these, you know, when it's really small log, you gotta put it up really high so you don't lose the little bit of log you have to work with. On a bigger log like this, I do have a weird shape here. It'd be nice to be putting the plate on there, but since the bow and the log is up, I just have to deal with this. But you can see with a giant log, or a much bigger log, you can use holes that are further out. And it doesn't matter quite as much that they're super close to the bottom of the plate. Also, this is a quarter inch steel. I don't know that that makes any difference. You know, you want something that's strong, but if it's uh, thinner than that, thicker than that, I don't think it's going to make any difference as long as it's not, you know, so thin it's going to flex. I think I, when I went and bought this from somebody's uh, scrap bin, I did the, the, you know, that manly grunt and shake. Oh yeah, that feels like the right size. 
it worked out. I just spray painted these. I think I primed it and sprayed it just so it wouldn't rust. I did make a previous video at least a year ago just on chainsaw milling. I'll put a link right here for you if you want to watch that. Um, but if you haven't seen that and you're wondering how exactly this is done, I'll just show you really quickly. Usually what I do is measure the, the log. That's 12 inches. Unfortunately, I got a rotten center here, so I can't mark it in the middle, but I'll find the center of the log so I can see roughly where that is. It's almost in the center there. And we'll go do the same on the other side. Now I cut this off. I didn't do a very good job of cutting it flat. I don't know. You know, it was probably binding on something, so I had to cut a, a couple different ways. Um, if it's a little bit out of square, it's all right, but this has some weird chunks cut, cut out of it. I'm not sure the plate's going to lay flat on there. But if this is tweaked a little bit this way or this way, it doesn't make too big a difference as long as it's not so far that the bars won't sit in the top of it. I'm going to go ahead and just cut the end of this off. Actually, just in the event that you don't have two saws, I always, I use two saws when I'm milling just for this exact kind of thing. I've already got one clamped in the mill and I don't want to take it up just to cut that off. I'll show you how you can do it while it's still in the mill. I guess ideally you cut the ends of all the logs off while they're in the pile and then you don't have to worry about it later on. And then you can put your saw in the mill. Go ahead and find the center of this one. And again, I'll put this uh, up as high as I can on the log here while still getting at least three screws in. I like to put the center one in first and then you can uh, level it off that. Whew, look at the water run out of that thing. Get that one leveled out. And clearly you get a better purchase if you use the wider screw holes, but for this small of a log, I'd have to drop the whole plate down a long ways to use the wider holes. So that's just what I'm gonna get. It's still, that's still pretty, plenty strong. So the reason you measure the center of the log on both ends, find that spot is that I'll put the plate, I just put the plate on the smallest end of the log and I put it up as high as I can go. Now I'm gonna measure from the center of the log up to the plate and then the plate on the fat end of the log is gonna get that same measurement. That way, if your tree's like this, the slabs that come off the top and the bottom are even. They start like this and they taper down. Sometimes if I've got a really screwy log, I'll just put the plates on both ends of the log up as high as I can and just start there because I know the outside of the log, that first and last cut are just gonna be garbage anyway, because they'll be all wiggly. But a lot of times, like the front of the mini cabin over here and the deer castle that I built, I use those cutoffs as siding. And you can really only do that if the cutoffs are somewhat consistent. So if you do start these at the same height, here's the center, put your plate here, here's the center, and you go up the same distance here, here. So you put your plate on this line going up, then you do you still end up with that taper, a little bit of a taper from this end to this end, but it'll be the same here. It's just not so extreme and it makes it so you can actually use these pieces if you want to. So the skinny end, I've got that at uh, three and three eighths. The center of the log is about right there, so we'll go three and three eighths is about there. Now with the really wide log, I can use these outside holes. This side will be really secure. So the length of the uh, bars that you use, these are 13, and I don't know how I picked 13. I think I was originally going to do like an 8 or 9 foot set and then another 15 foot set or something like that. You know, you could use the 9 foot set for making, if you're making a whole bunch of uh, framing for a single story building. And then if I needed to mill something really long, I'd get a longer one. And for whatever reason, I don't, I think I had to, when I bought these, he said, this is the length I have. And if you want shorter, I can cut it off, but I'm still gonna charge you for it. So I just took the whole thing. And really I haven't needed any longer ones. This is a uh, eighth inch wall thickness. You can see I put a, a bolt in there just in one side on both ends of each bar. And that's just so as you're milling, if this is sliding around, 
I can't actually show you because there's a tree in the way down there that these run into, but these will, these will slide and you don't want them to fall out. So this will just catch on the plate right here. I'm quite happy with the, the wall thickness on these. I do find if you go a full 13 feet, like by the time you get to the middle with the mill, you can get a little bit of vibration and you can actually see these flexing in the middle. So I'd say up to 12 or 13 feet, this is fine. If you're doing longer than that, I would definitely get a thicker one. But I mean, these are still pretty, pretty significant. I mean, they're, they're relatively heavy. And doing this all day, every day, I'm glad I don't have, you know, 16 foot bars that I got to move around that are even thicker than this. I don't know if you can see here, but uh, the end of the log is not quite square. But because these are cut a little bit bigger than uh, two inches, there's enough slop in there that the plate can be a little bit one direction or the other and it doesn't make a difference. And like I said, these plates are just mild steel, so I just used this. Uh, ba it's battery powered. I mean, it took a disc or two to cut those out, but not that big a deal. Cut it with just about anything. So now that we got a five inch plate plus another half inch that sticks up here, so five and a half, that'll be the setting for the first cut on the chainsaw mill, just to barely squeeze underneath this plate. So slide this up to five and a half plus a hair, just to make sure you don't nick the bottom of that. And the rest is just cutting. It should just clear the bottom there. Yep, perfect. You can see the thickness of the skinny end there. And then there was a lump in the log, a uh, curve, which I put up so it's a little bit, little bit thicker here. And then the other ends, not all too thick really. So it's got some weird shape. I don't know if I'd actually be able to use that, but if that was a normally shaped log, that's, uh, I mean, a usable board. I'd normally peel these, but since we got a freeze last night, it'd be kind of hard to get all this bark off of here. And hopefully, since I measured the log out and did the same height on either end, the last cut will probably come out about the same, except actually you could see the curve in the log. That uh, concave shape there might end up making the last board like this unusable. Drop this down to one inch. So I use one inch for the siding. If you had a bigger mill, which I think most people do use bigger mills than this, you'd have to uh, loosen the bolts on the end of it too so the whole table could drop down. Yeah, I guess there is one more thing to point out on this setup. Uh, I'm sure I saw this somewhere else too. I definitely didn't invent this. All this kind of makes me realize that I don't think I've ever had an original thought in my life. When my chain is sharp and or I have a small log or a short log, I don't generally use the winch. If I'm doing really heavy stuff that's really slow going, like when I mill those big aspens, like that big old down tree over there, I'll use that probably for a floor for something. It's so slow going and for that stuff, the chainsaw is underpowered that I'll pull the winch out You've seen me do this uh, when the logs are just back out in the forest and I don't have a way to get them on sawhorses because they're so big and heavy. 
I'll mill these right on the ground and I usually park the four-wheeler in front of the log and then I can pull the uh, winch cable out, hook it to the four-wheeler and use the winch just to slowly pull the, the saw along, the mill along. But if I recall, all I did was take this bolt out that's on the ratchet and feed it into the channel here. I might have had to replace that one bolt so that the head fit in that channel, but all I did was take the bolt out, slide it in there, tighten it back down. And it still moves a little bit, but it's a nylock on top so it doesn't come loose. And just leave it hanging there, and then if I need it, uh, I just pull it out, and I've got a uh, sling hooked on the tree down there. If your chain's sharp, and you're doing uh, milling within the reasonable limits of your setup, you shouldn't need to use a winch. The winch isn't really to grind itself through the wood. If you're having to push very hard, your saw is underpowered, or you've got any number of other issues. But on some of those giant logs that I occasionally mill with this that are the full width of the bar, it can take 10 minutes just to get through one slab because this is not a good setup for that. And just sitting in an awkward position and uh, pushing on the mill for that long and then doing slab after slab after slab, it's really nice to have the winch on there. I did just uh, all of a sudden realize that there probably aren't very many people that would use a chainsaw mill like I do. You know, not many people that are making white wood building materials all day with a chainsaw mill. Most of you are sensible enough to just go buy the stuff. I clearly am not that sensible. I don't ever want to spend the money on the lumber, especially nowadays it's so expensive, but I also really like milling with a chainsaw. There are plenty of reasons to uh, use a bandsaw mill instead of a chainsaw mill. I don't do it because, well, one, I really like chainsaw milling. Two, a lot of the logs that I mill, I can't move anyway. So I wouldn't be able to move the logs onto the bandsaw mill to cut them without sinking a whole bunch more money into uh, equipment and roads or trails flat enough out here to drive the equipment around. It just gets out of control so fast. So I'm really lucky. I'm lucky that I really just, I like doing this. I don't mind doing this for five days in a row, 10 hours a day. I still like right to the last hour. I just really enjoy doing it. So I'll pull this out anyway. I assume most of you guys have been watching this channel forever and you've seen this a thousand times, but uh, I'll pull it out just to show you the, the winch in action. I just switched this out uh, recently. I think, oh, I used the steel cable off of this when Tito and I were making that uh, walking shooting range we did recently. I didn't have enough uh, steel cable to hang all the targets, so I pulled it off of this and uh, cut it into pieces. But luckily I had an old, I took the old uh, synthetic winch cable off the, my old four-wheeler and put it on here. This is the first time I pulled it out, but holy cow, that is so much easier to pull out than the steel cable. And if you don't have pressure on it like this, it doesn't overspool itself. Should have thought of that a long time ago. I'll show you that this chain is sharp enough and this wood is soft enough. Um, you'll see that the the winch in this instance really isn't doing anything. I mean, it is keeping everything going along, but you can see how little pressure you should. If this is perfectly set up and really sharp, the, the mill should almost just pull itself through the log, especially with soft wood like this. Just threw this little tiny log up here. Again, it's one that's barely worth milling, but uh, why not? Better than having to burn it or find something else to do with it. You can see if I put this up as absolutely as high as I could to where these screws are, they're in the sap wood and they're probably very nearly breaking through there. If all these holes were a little bit lower, you could move it up just a little bit more. Clearly, if you're not dealing with really small logs like this, which I assume most people aren't, that wouldn't make any difference. Yeah, that's worth it. What might look like a stick of firewood ends up being something you can actually use to build something silly. I think it's worth 10 or 12 minutes, don't you?
What a day. Holy cow. This is amazing. Came out here, I milled a couple logs and I started sweating. I was like, I take my bibs off, but what am I gonna wear? First day in my chainsaw pants, got my fire boots back out, put these things on and my feet started hurting within maybe six minutes. It takes so long every year for my feet to break back into these boots. Last night as I was falling asleep, there were a couple things popped into my head that I uh, didn't mention. One is the bars. If you're gonna make one of these setups, uh, get the bars like a foot and a half to two feet longer than the longest log you think you're, you'll mill. I mean, in my experience, you don't really want to go overboard and say, well, I might mill a 20 foot log, so I'll get, you know, 22 foot bars. It's just, it's too much of a pain in the butt to move them around. Pick a reasonable size you think you'll do, get it two feet longer, and they should uh, work pretty well for you. They just have to be that little bit longer so you could set the mill on it for the first cut before you start it. I've seen uh, some people's milling setups and I've heard from people that say they tried milling, they bought a mill and it really didn't go very well. And I'm going to take a guess, more than likely, it's probably because of the chain. I say that because I struggled with that for over a year. When Tito was out here, we were both milling all the time and it was a pain in the butt. But if you find yourself having to work the chainsaw through back and forth and the boards don't come out really nice, what I recommend is go to Granberg. I think it's Granberg.com. Get the milling chains that they have. Take a brand new chain, put it on your saw and try the cut. If it doesn't cut well, then, you know, you've, <laughs> you've got other problems. But for us, we tried, we tried every single chain and an every angle of sharpening, everything we could think of, and just was, it was kind of a disaster, mostly because our chains were sharpened too aggressively. So it would cut really well, but just for a very short time. And then all of a sudden it would stop cutting. You do like one board or a half a board, and then it would go to hell. And you'd think, well, you know, I'm not gonna stop and switch it out now or sharpen it right now, I'm gonna keep going. And you just spend like, you know, half an hour pushing a doll chain through, uh, through a log, you know. Um, I think this showed up in one of my, previous videos or two. Um, I'm all right at uh, hand filing. And I think that's totally reasonable for regular cutting, for cross cutting, cutting down trees, limbing trees and that kind of stuff. Because by comparison, the chain doesn't have to be nearly as sharp as it does when you mill. So, you know, you can have a somewhat dull chain and you can still cut through a log. It'll just take you a little longer. When you're milling, if it's not sharp, nothing happens. Everything just gets hot. A lot of times, even now, I'll be pushing the chain a little bit too long and I'll start seeing steam come off the end of the bar, which, I mean, I'm milling very green wood, so it's not like if you get a little bit of steam in the middle of the winter that, you know, you're going to melt something. I've never overheated anything. But after struggling for a few months, uh, when I first came out here to mill, I finally just thought, you know what, I want to have more than one or two chains. I don't want to pull the thing out of the mill every 10 or 15 minutes and have to get the file out. So I went on, I think I went on Amazon or something and just read the reviews and got the cheapest bench grinder uh, sharpener that I could find that had decent reviews. I think it was, I don't know, maybe $40 at most. It's uh, this thing. I don't even know who makes it. I'll figure out who, I'll figure out who makes it and put a uh, link in the description. You know, I don't like to buy stuff better than what I need, or especially if I don't know I'm gonna need it. Like, I, I'm not the kind of guy that's like, I have to have the best of everything. But this sharpener, it's it lasted two years. I can't even imagine how many chains I sharpened with this thing. And it worked great. Just recently, the last couple of weeks, the, the motor started to make a little bit of noise. Like it got a little bit louder. So I thought, you know, I'll get a replacement for it. I'll keep this in case the, re the new one goes down at some point, I still have this to use in the meantime. But it's worked great it only has one adjustment on it you know you can adjust the the angle you just loosen the knob on the bottom turn this actually i could sharpen a milling chain at least 20 times with this thing and possibly even 30 times and that's because it's it's not super aggressive and since the milling chains you're not going until they're all bunged up you're just barely dulling them and then touching them up with this so I think this thing's great. It's a great use of not very much money. And for the average person that's doing this, it would probably last you 10 years. And just yesterday, actually, after I finished milling, I came over here, I set up the new grinder that I got and used it. And man, it's it's a really nice tool. It's really expensive, but holy cow, is it aggressive comparatively. And I know anybody that's used these before, they're gonna say, no, that's the norm. And the other one you had was just weak and wimpy. That's probably the case. I'm just not used to using this thing.
you can see the difference in the size of the motor. It's like five times as big. But if you're just sharpening milling chains, it's, I don't think it's necessary. I got it because I may end up staying out here for the rest of my life, in which case I don't want to buy a new one of those every couple of years. So anyway, if you're trying to mill, it's not going well. More than likely your chain isn't sharpened just right. There is, I mentioned that there, I already made a video just on milling last year. I'll make sure to put a link to that in the description. And then, and then also there's the video just on milling chains where I tested five or four, five, six different milling chains at different angles, all on the same cut on the same board. So you could see one after the other. I'll put a link to that one too. And also along with having a really sharp chain all the time, if you're milling uh, some softwoods like pine, especially it's got a lot of sap in it and you get it hot, it'll actually kind of bake onto the chain and it does Unfortunately, it does make a big difference. What I do is just use a plastic container, fill it up with uh, rubbing alcohol, throw the chains in there. You can see, I haven't scrubbed this off yet. I don't know if you can see how much stuff is on the side of this. Right now, it'll just wipe off of there. So I just let it soak for you know an hour or a day or whatever, and then uh, just take a plastic scrub brush like this, and all that stuff will just come right off. So that does make a big difference. I've noticed, because I've, I've milled one log with two identical chains and one that was covered in sap just because I wanted to see how much more drag there was or what a difference there was, and it was a lot. So clean them if you got to. My guess is that with a lot of, lot of species, it's not really an issue. You know, a little bit of dirt or bar oil or whatever on the chain links isn't gonna make any difference, but if you have a real sappy one, it can really slow down your cutting process. And that batch of chains that I just sharpened, I probably sharpened, I don't know, seven, eight, nine of them or something. That was the only one that I pulled out to soak and clean off because the rest aren't really that bad. Holy moly. This video got a lot more involved than I expected it to be. I was hoping just to answer questions about the measurement for this mill, but you know, once I start going, I think of all the emails I get and the comments and everything, people asking questions about, you know, the individual pieces of gear that I'm using or why this doesn't work or, how would you do this better? So I'll just reiterate, don't certainly, if you're gonna get into chainsaw milling, don't just run out and get all the stuff I've got. It's all worked really well for me, but it's gonna make a big difference what you're trying to mill, how much you're trying to mill, all that kind of stuff. But my guess is for most chainsaw milling, these bars are a pretty good setup. Thanks YouTube. Thanks for suggesting me that video a long time ago where a guy was using these. All right, does that cover it? You feel good? You good? All right, glad to hear it. I'm going to finish up a few more logs and then see if I can't figure out how to build an outdoor shower in the middle of the woods without water or power that I can use in the middle of the Michigan winter. Well, good luck, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> I think I'm going to need it. Thanks for watching. See you guys next week.